In this video, we are going to be looking at topic three of GCSE biology, and that topic is infection and response. As you can see on screen now, here are all the subtopics that we're going to be looking at in more depth throughout this video. All of these notes are available on my Etsy page, which is linked in the description. So feel free to go and have a look if you want to. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy. Starting us off, we have communicable disease. A communicable disease is simply a disease that can spread. So it can be spread from person to person, for example. There are four main types of pathogen or effectively disease, and that includes bacteria, virus, fungi and protist. It is crucial that you remember all four of those, and we will talk in more depth about each of those later on in the video. How do they spread? There are three main ways. The first one is water, the second one air, and the third way is direct contact. In the textbooks you will find there are a few more examples. I think there's five in total, but these are the main three, and in exams you're often only asked for maximum three anyway. As promised, here are the four different pathogens in more detail. On the top left, you can see bacteria. So this is a bacteria cell, the little diagram. They are very, very small cells, and they ultimately produce toxins that damage your cells. Two examples of bacteria are salmonella and gonorrhea. All that information is very important to remember. Our next one we have is the virus. Virus are not cells. They use your body cells as hosts and replicate inside of them. And because of this, antibiotics do not work on them. Measles and HIV are two examples that you could use in an exam. Third, we have fungi. Fungi and protists you don't necessarily need a picture for or a diagram because there isn't really one at GCSE level. Fungi can be single-celled or multicellular with a body-like structure called a hyphae. That is more if you're aiming for the higher level, so foundation, do not worry too much about that name. And rose black spot is a very, very good example of this. It causes black spots to form on the plant leaves, which reduces the photosynthesis that can happen. And finally, protist. The only protist example you need to know is malaria. Protists are often single-celled eukaryotic cells. Most protists you'll come across are parasites that are transferred by what we call a vector. And a vector is effectively an organism, such as a mosquito, that takes the malaria from one place to another. So how can we prevent the disease? We can reduce the spread of the disease by being hygienic, washing our hands before preparing food or after sneezing. We can destroy the vectors, so we can try and contain those mosquitoes or get rid of them, for example by using insecticides or destroying habitats. We can isolate the infected people, so if someone becomes infected with a disease, isolate them away from people. This is something we saw a lot of in COVID-19 time, so this is something that everyone is familiar with. And finally, vaccines. So vaccinate people to build up what we call herd immunity. Herd immunity, imagine there are 100 people in a room and 60 of those people have been vaccinated. Those 60 people will effectively create a wall around the people that haven't been vaccinated and imagine that disease is trying to get from person to person, but it can't affect these people that have been vaccinated. So it protects it very well in that group. Down here, I have a bonus challenge for you. Explain how vaccinations work in reducing the spread of comments. I will mark all your answers in the comments. It's a very common four marker that I would highly recommend every single one of you becomes familiar with. I can almost guarantee it will come up. Fighting disease. So let's say we haven't been able to prevent that disease and it has reached our body. Our body has three lines of defense. The first line of defense involves the skin. We have enzymes in the tears called lysozymes, which again, only higher, so don't worry too much about that foundation. We have hairs in our nose and ears, often called cilia. We have stomach acid, which is around a pH two, so very, very high acidity. Any bacteria that gets into our stomach will be instantly killed by that. And finally, mucus in our throat and nose. So these are often physical barriers that stop the pathogens getting into our body. The second line of defence are known as phagocytes. And these are one of your white blood cells. The phagocytes hunt down the pathogens as they are bind together by antibodies. So to put that into something that makes a bit more sense, the antibodies effectively stick 
to multiple pathogens. So instead of the phagocyte having to chase, say, 10 different pathogens, the antibodies will clump them all together into one big clump, and the phagocyte can get all 10 of them at once. These phagocytes then proceed to digest the pathogens and effectively get rid of them. And for our third line of defence, we have also white blood cells. These are called lymphocytes. So the phagocytes and lymphocytes work together. When the phagocytes digest those pathogens, there is a small protein called an antigen on the pathogen that is used almost like a fingerprint that we would use on a human. So it identifies an individual type of pathogen. The lymphocyte uses that and helps the body remember what that pathogen is. Because of that, we can produce specific antibodies. So if that pathogen comes back in, the body can be like, oh, we recognise this one. We're going to release some more antibodies and it will speed up the process of us fighting that disease. For those of you that did pause and comment your exam question that I put on the last slide, this is how a vaccination works. A dead or inactive version of a pathogen is entered into the body. This triggers an immune response without actually causing harm to the body because that pathogen that we've introduced is dead or inactive. The white blood cells engulf the pathogen, so that would be our phagocytes, allowing them to remember and store antibodies for that pathogen. That is where the lymphocytes come in. And as I said, next time the live pathogen enters that will actually cause harm, the immune system can quickly mass produce those antibodies to destroy the pathogen and reduce the harm to the body. Finally, we have drug development. So drug development involves the idea of a new medicine coming to the general public, for example. So there are four stages to this. Stage one, the new drugs are modelled in a computer program based on data. So effectively, a kind of model world is brought up and it just sees what would happen if that drug was introduced now. Stage two, they are then tested on live cells or tissues to see how they react, so how they're going to react with things like your mitochondria and all your other organelles like that. Stage three, after this, they are tested on live animals mimicking humans as closely as possible. And stage four, finally, they are tested on human volunteers in a clinical trial using placebo and a double blind trial. I want you to be familiar with both placebo and double blind trial as we can see down below on the screen. A placebo is a fake version of a drug used to remove psychological effects of the medication. To put that again into something that makes more sense, Effectively, you've got 10 people in a room that think they're part of this trial. You give five of them the actual medication and you might give five of them a sweet that does absolutely nothing, but it looks the same and it tastes the same. By doing this, you remove, as I said, the psychological effects. Because you think you've taken the medicine, you might instantly think you're better. But if someone that's just taken the sweet thinks they're better, then that makes no sense. So that is what we call a psychological effect. And a double blind trial relates back to the placebo, where both the patients and the doctors, which is why it's a double blind, don't know where the placebo is or who has the real medication. And this is purely to remove bias in the results. When we do this drug development trial, we're looking for three things. We look for efficacy, dosage and toxicity. And as you can see down below, the efficacy is how effective the medication is. The dosage is how much the patients need to take when they have this medication and toxicity measures any side effects that we might want to avoid or we could then go back and change something slightly to reduce that side effect happening. That sums up all of infection and response. Thank you very much for watching. The next video, bioenergetics, which involves photosynthesis and respiration. So I will see you in the next one. Like and subscribe if you found this useful.